I'm talking to John R. Bradley, who's a foreign correspondent who's dedicated his life to writing about the Middle East for publications all around the world. In the wake of the Arab Spring, he says far from the democratic pluralism that the West assumed would take over, what's in fact rushing into the power vacuum is Islamists. John R. Bradley, thanks very much for talking to us today. Now, we'll start with the situation in Iran because it's very much in the news at the moment. The EU has banned all new oil contracts with the country and it plans to extend sanctions on the Iranian central bank. How much do you think that's going to cost Iran, uh, the EU and the global economy in general? It's certainly going to cost Iran. We've seen today the real, the local currency, um, at its weakest uh, level against the US dollar in history. And uh, the fact is that Iran exports a, a sizable amount of its oil to the EU and coupled with American sanctions, unilateral sanctions are already in place against Iran, it's going to hurt. But what we're seeing essentially is the first phase of economic warfare against Iran. And the problem is that the West has Iran all wrong, just as it has the Middle East all wrong. It believes that sanctions will increase the divide between the regime and the people and uh, historically this doesn't happen there's no proof that this happens whatsoever it's people feel pressured and they look at where that pressure is coming from and that's the West and so uh, it makes them more anti-Western that's the only logical outcome and it also hopes that if there is serious instability as a result then because Iran is very ethnically and geographically um, divided that certain groups will rise up against the regime or there will be a popular uprising. But again, um, it's wishful thinking. It's not going to happen at all. And we saw years of sanctions in Iraq, didn't we? Is, is that a comparison that you draw? Yeah, and then we saw war. And all of this is leading to war. Um, the hawks in Washington, their allies in Saudi Arabia and Israel are absolutely, absolutely determined to bring Iran to its knees. And uh, it seems like it's now or never and they're going for broke. So what will happen next, do you think? What, what does the, the sort of usual lead-up involve? What they're hoping for is that Iran um, is backed into a corner and some incident occurs, whether by accident or design, that makes it seem that the Iranians shot the first arrow, as it were. And then, because there's very little support in the West for a unilateral strike against Iran. And the fact is that, especially if it's done at the behest of Israel, and so they need Iran to do something. Whether it's uh, that a U.S. carrier hits a mine uh, in the Strait of Hormuz, or whether it's just rhetoric on the part of the Iranian regime. Um, it, Everyone's up it, upping the ratchet to the extent that something has to happen. And the Americans wouldn't have militarized the zone to the extent that they have if they weren't expecting the final out outcome to be war. Do you see that that trigger could be the Iranians blocking the Strait of Hormuz, the Gulf oil export route, as they're now promising that they will? Yeah, although it's not saying that it will do that um, just as a result of sanctions. It's threatening to do that in the event that it's uh, attacked. And uh, that's just one of many things that uh, Iran is threatening to do and has the capability to do. You are very worried about ethnic divisions uh, all through the Middle East, uh, which you say have come to the fore in both Iran and also in Syria. Um, if Sunni Islamists gain control of most of the Middle East, what do you think the outcome could be for the majority Shiite Iran? Obviously, all of this is bad news uh, for Iran. And in fact, if you look back at the Arab Spring, the turning point came in late February when Saudi Arabia was given the go-ahead by Washington to invade Bahrain. And what happened then is related very much to everything that's happening now because Bahrain is the only country that is a Shia majority but ruled by a Sunni minority. And Iran has historic claims to the island and the US Navy's fifth fleet is based there and it's absolutely crucial to containing Iran. And so uh, essentially what we've seen is a Sunni-Shia divide re-emerge in the Middle East with Washington clearly backing uh, the sunny powerhouse Saudi Arabia, a close American ally, and Saudi Arabia in turn, along with Qatar, has taken control of the revolutions elsewhere. And so, for example, it's funding a Nahada, the main Islamist party in Tunisia. The Muslim Brotherhood and more extremist Salafi groups in, in Egypt are on the record are saying they've got substantial funds from Saudi Arabia. The Yemeni government has openly criticized Qatar for interfering in its internal affairs and funding radical Islamists. And of course, in Syria, the, op the main civilian 
opposition um, is made dominated by Muslim, the Muslim Brotherhood, and the so-called Free Syrian Army is dominated by not only radical jihadis from within Syria, but also jihadis from throughout the region. And so when we're told constantly that there's no real threat because these are moderate Islamist parties, but of course the definition of moderate makes absolutely no sense in any rational terms, because... Saudi Arabia is often described preposterously in the Western media as a moderate Arab state. Now, I lived in Saudi Arabia for three years, and I can assure you there's absolutely nothing moderate about that country at all. You say that, uh, that it's sort of Islamist groups who have stepped into the breach in many of these countries. Are you saying that these weren't genuine people's uprisings at the time? No, the, the idea of behind it is that they hijacked the revolutions and precisely because they weren't in fact Islamists um, inspired at the beginning. In Tunisia it could never have been because uh, the Islamists were either in prison or exiled and the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt openly came out against the revolution initially. The problem is that the motivation for these revolutions was economic that in Tunisia, for example, it started in the Deep South, the impoverished, neglected Deep South. In Syria, it started in Dera, a city near Jordan, which had been experiencing a drought for three years. And in Egypt, an extensive opinion poll carried out, even among those who went to Tahrir just after Mubarak fell, showed that only 19% of them put uh, free and fair elections and free expression and so on at the top of their agenda. Their main priority, 65%, was the economy. Now, the people People who provoked these revolutions foolishly declared their revolutions leaderless and they didn't have an agenda. Anyone who knows anything about revolutionary uprisings in the past, and specifically Iran, the most relevant, the 79 revolution in Iran, knows that what happens in the post-revolutionary chaos is that uh, the groups that are most disciplined um, and most ruthless politically then fill the vacuum. And so when you couple that with the fact that they're then, with the funding that we've been talking about from Saudi Arabia and Qatar, able to manipulate the electoral process, um, they were perfectly poised to, to, to step into the, into the gap and, and fill the vacuum, and that's what they've done. What about the Free Syrian Army? Is what they're fighting for a genuine democracy, in your view? Whether or not they're fighting for democracy, uh, is an open question. What kind of democracy we then have to ask? And I'm just appalled and gobsmacked at the coverage that uh, this jihadi outfit has been given. You can't get a word in edgeways in trying to criticize it or, or trying to illustrate just what a horrible bunch of extremists these people are. And there's a very string of credible reports that have shown that uh, Qatar, especially, and other Persian Gulf states have been funding jihad is not only from within the country but from Libya for example and elsewhere and I find it very difficult to believe that this outfit has as its ultimate goal western style democracy and pluralism and freedom. Is what we're seeing in Syria basically an exported Islamic revolution? Absolutely, if there, we've been hearing constant uh, greatly exaggerated predictions of the Syrian regime's demise for 11 months now. If a popular revolution was going to happen, it would have happened already. The fact is that though they may have no great love for their cucumber-faced president, Assad, um, the, the, there, there's this general feeling of better the devil we know. And you talk about the Arab League. Do you think that the mission in Syria has essentially played into the hands of those who are exerting pressure on the Syrian authorities? And is it overstepping its mark when it makes demands rather than mediating? Yeah, the Arab League essentially has no credibility on the Arab street and everyone knows that it's a tool of the GCC. And so its aim is not to create momentum that the Arab League itself can then implement, although it can and has imposed sanctions and it suspended Syria and could possibly impose a no-fly zone. What they're hoping to do is what they did with Libya before. If you remember, before the UN resolution on Libya, the Arab League convened, and conveniently almost all of those who voted were from the Gulf Cooperation Council in support of the no-fly zone in Libya. What the Arab League mission is trying to accomplish is get enough evidence, concrete evidence, about human rights abuses on the part of the Assad regime 
to then take that to the UN, and the evidence will be so strong that even Russia and China will feel compelled to act. But as of now, one month after this mission started, um, they seem to know, the monitors seem to know no more about what's going on the ground than they did uh, at the beginning. And so uh, it all looks like it'll be going back to square one. And in contrast to Libya, so far Western nations have been absolutely adamant that they're not going to go into Syria. Why do you think that is? It doesn't have a seaport uh, f uh, in the way that... It's not on the coast in the way that, for example, um, Benghazi was on the coast in Libya. And so it's far more difficult militarily to get in supplies. It's also not resource, resource rich. Um, you know, obviously they went into Libya because it has a great deal of oil and they continue to support Saudi Arabia and Qatar because they have a great deal of oil and gas. There's no great payoff, immediate payoff when it comes to Syria. But there is a great deal to be gained geopolitically, but they can bide their time and they're hoping for an internal collapse or, barring that, that the Arab League somehow manages to weaken the regime enough that we've heard, for example, the uh, Amir of Qatar saying that Arab League troops should be sent in. And so uh, the West is quite happy for the time being for the Arabs to do their dirty work. John R. Bradley, thank you very much. Thank you.